All right. So with that note, now we are moving in at the end of this segment for the technical track of uh, Connected Apps theme. And last but not the least, we have Mark Tihan, Principal Solution Engineer at Confluent Asia Pacific. And he will be sharing some interesting updates aligning with the previous session uh, by the topic REST, the events, REST APIs for event-driven architecture. So with that note, I uh, would like to welcome Mark. I'm glad to have you here as part of API Days Live India. Any of the questions that uh, the audience might have, we will take at the end of your sessions. So the stage is all yours. Welcome once again. Thank you very much, Jiraj. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a real privilege to be here. I'd like to thank the API Days team for the opportunity to speak to everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Tehan. I'm a principal engineer with Confluent. I'm joining you from Singapore today. Um, and today's title, uh, today's talk is REST the Events, uh, REST APIs for Event Driven Architecture. So um, let me get my slides advancing. There we go. Um, so uh, I kind of work with uh, organizations across Asia Pacific that are using uh, Apache Kafka or Confluent, the commercial version of Apache Kafka, um, and including lots of trips over to uh, to uh, users in across India, uh, particularly in Bangalore. So um, today's talk is really um, uh, again somewhat focused on Apache Kafka, but more really uh, more focused on the uh patterns usage patterns of apache kafka so we won't be going that deep into the technicals of a kafka apart from a quick introduction for anyone that a doesn't have kafka fatigue uh, and b that may not know about kafka so just a quick recap like kafka is a modern distributed platform for data streams and like any data processing platform it has writers and readers you know these are producers and consumers in kafka parlance um, and they talk to a cluster of Kafka brokers, um, as you just saw in the last talk. Um, there's a really good uh, YouTube video from my colleague Tim Berglund uh, going into um, you know, some of the origins and uses of Apache Kafka, which I, I would really recommend that you take a look at. Um, so it, it, Kafka is used for all sorts of things. It really started out as a sort of a, a replacement for the, the, the family of MQ type products, but that was 12 years ago. And it's really come a long way since then. Um, and I think the fact that Kafka is still one of the most popular open source projects available is kind of testament to, the, to, to how it has improved and evolved uh, over the last 12 years or so. Um, so now we see it widely adopted, of course, for event-driven apps, which we're going to be looking at a bit today. Um, there's a lot of data in motion. You know, I, I spent most of my career as a as database administrator forever trying to get queries to run faster so that we can come closer to the, nirv the nirvana of sort of real-time uh, responses. But that's really what Kafka is for, right? Um, so if you're, if you're sort of caught in a, a death spiral of uh, database cursors trying to make stuff faster, then maybe it's time to switch over to Kafka. We do a lot of mainframe offload, um, connecting up legacy systems to, uh, to modern systems, usually microservices. I'm trying to bridge between these two very different worlds. Um, and and a, a fairly traditional usage is also for shipping logs and metrics and traces and just using Kafka as a big pipe between different systems. Um, that's as much as we're going to sort of go into on the fundamentals of Apache Kafka today. So let's take a look at the different ways that you talk to an Apache Kafka system. Kafka, of course, is, built, is written in Scala and Java. Uh, it's part of a the whole Java ecosystem. So, you know, most of the clients that use Kafka are Java. Now, you don't have to be. There are other top tier clients, .NET and Python and Go as well. Um, but uh, the reality is that most Kafka users use Java frameworks. And you de deploy an application, use the, uh, uh, um, include the Kafka, the Kafka client library uh, in your framework, which is often Spring Boot, um, and start producing into the Kafka topic. And similarly, on the consumer, just using the standard Kafka client in order to do that. So the very common, uh, unsurprising pattern of using a framework to talk to a server, nothing surprising there. Um, you can also talk to your Kafka system using request response type calls uh, using the Confluent REST proxy. So the Confluent REST proxy runs on a VM or a uh, container or a pod. Uh, it's a community uh, licensed uh, server. Um, it opens connections to the Kafka brokers, and uh, it basically allows you to produce and consume as you would if you were using a framework. Um, and it's possible to both produce, which is pretty straightforward, but also to consume, and to consume at high volume, 
from uh, Kafka topics uh, using the REST proxy. It uses like sticky sessions and uh, it's, it's still able to form consumer groups and all that sort of good stuff that you get with the, with the um, Java client. The third common pattern for communicating with the Kafka system is, of course, using other data stores in the organization, commonly databases. And in this case, often we want to do CDC. And the, the, the pattern of choice here is really using Kafka Connect. Kafka Connect was released about five years after the Kafka brokers. It was the second API. Um, and it solves the problem of ETL in real time for Kafka systems. So there are plenty of ETL tools out there. Mo most are designed as batch ETL tools with sort of real time as an afterthought. Um, so Kafka Connect is a framework that, that really connects to a wide variety of source and sync systems. And it allows you, it, it converts whatever the data access pattern is into Kafka produce and consume commands. So for instance, you could do change data capture from an Oracle database using the Confluent CDC, and then you could sync back out to, say, a Snowflake database using the Snowflake sync, or send it to Postgres or MySQL or whatever. Very common pattern. Um, and then the final one is, what if none of these patterns really fit the type of framework that you're trying to connect to? Um, so what if you're using SAP or NetSuite or any other sort of large application framework? A common pattern here is to continue to use Kafka Connect, but use a HTTP sync. Um, almost all of these third-party application frameworks you know, have very rich HTTP interfaces. Um, and it's possible to stream from a topic into, say, um, an endpoint in SAP-PO um, by using the HTTP sync, where you will basically construct the URL. Uh, Kafka Connect will authenticate with SAP PI and then start streaming data from the topic directly into uh, SAP. Um, and it's also possible to use the, uh, the, the framework. So SAP, of course, comes with ABAP as their programming framework. You can uh, connect an ABAP application to Kafka um, by using HTTP calls and calling the REST proxy. We have a number of customers, particularly here in, in uh, Asia, that have large SAP estates. Uh, but they still they, they want to be to avail of all the benefits of, of building an event streaming application. And this is a fairly uh, good, a good option for connecting these types of systems up. The final option is actually directly on the broker itself. So if you're a Kafka user, you're used to, to sort of talking to the Kafka broker on port 9092 um, if you're, or 9093 if you're, if you're turning on SSL. Um, but there's also an, uh, a, a port available 8090, which is a new HTTP port. And we look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, so the options that we're going to focus on today really are, let's take a look at sort of the request response pattern for talking to Apache Kafka. Uh, compare that with the event streaming pattern uh, for talking to the brokers. And then finally, we'll have, uh, well, not quite finally, we'll have a look at the REST proxy and see how that fits in. Uh, as an option as part of your uh, uh, estate. And then we, we'll have a brief look at the other sort of HTTP interfaces that are available on the platform. OK, so let's start this with request response. Uh, I don't know how many times you're going to hear this phrase today. It sounds like it's a pretty popular theme across all the talks. Uh, you know, and, and you know, there's, there's no need to really elaborate uh, on what, uh, what re request response is. But um, ultimately, these are, these are typically low latency calls. They're typically point to point. Um, there's, there's always the presumption of a response, um, and there's you know quite a, a predefined API. We tend to come across quite a number of these types of systems where Apache Kafka is replacing an earlier generation of data store uh, for the system. So perhaps there was a database there before, um, and we want, to, we want they want to keep the same application, but but convert it over to a sort of an event streaming application. So they strip out the database layer put in Kafka, and then try and convert the calls over to request response. Um, the second pattern for connecting to brokers is event streaming. Um, and this is, this is somewhat different, because in this case, we're going to drop the messages into a queue, or in, in, you know, in the Kafka world, we'll call it a topic. Um, and basically, once we have dropped the message in, we don't, the producer doesn't really care about it anymore. It's going to be processed later. And it may, it may be consumed by zero consumers, one consumer, or infinite consumers. The producer doesn't care because we have decoupled um, the, the producer from the consumer. There's usually an assumption here of continuous processing, um, events that trigger other events that trigger other events. Um, and that's what we mean by something being event driven. If you're, um, you know, a follower of, uh, you know, any of the, the uh, uh, popular event driven paradigms, uh, particularly by ThoughtWorks and Martin Fowler and uh, his excellent blog blogging in this area, and 
perhaps also on the Confluent blog site, we do a lot of blogging about developing applications using this event-driven paradigm. Um, then this is a, a, an exciting way of uh, developing new applications. Um, generally, there's no presumption of a response for this, uh, for this pattern. Um, and it's usually for general purpose events because you're signaling that something has happened on the system. So let's take a quick look at the challenges of these two uh, in order to determine which, you know, which is the right one uh, to go with. With request response, it is difficult to enforce standards. Uh, often these are legacy applications moving into an event streaming world. Um, and uh, and you, know, you already have a problem there where, where you're sort of uh, swapping out one layer, swapping in another, but the standards kind of um, are, have been built for a different type of system. Um, it can be difficult to scale if the servers are synchronous. If you're running the sort of business that has sort of a very, a much larger peak than your average, so if month end is much much busier than middle month middle, uh, if you're a bank or or you know a retailer or something of that nature, um, then you may face some challenges with scaling infrastructure up to deal with these sorts of peaks. We find that a lot of uh, applications are moving towards Apache Kafka because it does scale uh, well, even when the difference between average and peak is like very very large, five x, ten x, fifteen x. Kafka can generally cope with this perfectly fine. Um, in that sense, it's almost like a shock absorber for data sitting between two different systems. Um, there are risky uh, inter-service dependencies, uh, again, kind of tying back to complexity. Uh, servers are, are required to maintain state. While you're waiting for a response, what if something happens? You send a request, your VM fails, and then you have to maintain that state so that you can restart that request in the, in the correct, uh, at the correct point without uh, duplicating any data. It's complex. Uh, complex management and version compatibility, that's not really uh, particular to request response, uh, but uh, it's certainly no easier for request response. And it requires some form of load balancing, right? You're, you're centralizing an awful lot of calls via HTTP services. Um, and you need to think about, do we do this in one data center or multiple data centers? Uh, and do we need to, to offer uh, uh, load balancing for uh, load management as well? Uh, on the Kafka side of things, uh, the infrastructure can be a bit more complex. You tend to see deployment of containerized client applications for Kafka systems, so in pods or in containers, in order to avail of Kafka's ability to build consumer groups. Right? So it would be very unusual to build an application where you have one producer, your brokers, and one consumer. That's really just piping data through, and you can achieve that kind of functionality with you know, MQ or, uh, or any sort of pub sub system. The real power of Kafka is having one producer, your brokers, and many consumers. And those consumers could be, uh, they could be entirely independent of each other, operating at different speeds and streaming the data out to different types of systems. So one to Elastic, one to a microservice, one to Snowflake, one to S3. They'll operate at different speeds. And, and the consumer framework within Kafka will ensure that, that uh, you know, nobody ever gets a duplicate message, nobody ever uh, gets a, uh, has a skipped message. But the real power of Kafka, of course, is having multiple consumers cooperating, what we call a consumer group. So you can have 50 consumers in a single group all cooperating together, and they divide up the, the load of, of um, consuming the data and sending it out to the client uh, together, including things like uh, having standbys and uh, failover and, and et cetera, all of this sort of thing. That's the real power of Kafka. Um, so that does tend to trigger more complex infrastructure as you think about uh, having everything containerized and scalable to take advantage of your Kafka consumer features. Um, event thinking can be hard. Uh, you know, it, it just one read of a Martin Fowler blog post, and you know, it's it, it's di it's difficult to wrap your head around the Kafka way of doing things. Um, so we do tend to see, and I'm 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 in this I'm in this camp myself. Uh, you know, there's quite a long learning curve to switching over from a sort of a database client server paradigm um, over to event thinking. Um, and you do have to kind of do things the Kafka way in order to fully exploit Kafka. So you have to observe how things like uh, exactly once works and, and abide by the guidelines for that. If there are service goals for your system for things like throughput or latency and all that, you do have to observe those and configure the system the right way. Um, Kafka is not particularly easy. It's getting easier, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's you know um, not, not the easiest system to set up and manage. Um, all right, so when do we want to use HTTP with Kafka? Just a sort of final point on this before we start looking at some of the endpoints. So there are really three uh, considerations. The first one is uh, the management plane, um, the data plane, and other reasons. So management plane are things like cluster configuration, DevOps integration. You know, if you're going to be 
automating creation of topics and schemas and things like that, you want to do it over a HTTP API. You wouldn't write a Python application to do something like this. So that makes perfect sense. I'm speeding up slightly here. Um, uh, on the data plane, you know, mobile applications are a very natural fit for HTTP calls um, because of their high level of chattiness, because of the sort of natural infrastructure that they use with web sockets and server send events. It's a pretty good fit. Uh, if you're dealing with legacy applications like the SAP type stuff, um, then it's good. You know, uh, I use ABAP and do HTTP calls, and you can integrate these two systems. Whatever you do, don't put a database or some other data store in between them in order to facilitate uh, data flow. You can just use HTTP calls. If you're using API gateways, um, many of them don't have native event streaming support. Um, so it, it's a, it can be a good option, again, to use the best next, next best option, which is usually HTTP or REST. And, and if you're using a, a programming framework, uh, and there's a surprising amount of COBOL out there that's talking to Kafka. If you're using an, uh, one of these frameworks that that has a, that doesn't have enough support um, for you, then HTTP is probably a better option than trawling GitHub to try and find a client that works for you. Um, other reasons are avoiding technology lock-in. Some companies just are just framework agnostic. They don't want to use Java, Python, or .NET and do everything via HTTP. Um, if you're if you're moving a legacy system over to uh, event streaming, then it's familiar and it's quicker and easier than sort of starting the event streaming API. Security uh, is easier for HTTP than TCP. And finally, you may well have a hybrid. Uh, I know quite a few banks that operate in this way, and they use a service mesh to, to link up uh, event streaming using the Kafka protocol with uh, REST APIs for sort of synchronous client server stuff. All right. Um, so that was when to use HTTP with Kafka. So we talk about the three different Kafka APIs. So the Confluent REST proxy runs on a VM, on Docker, or on Kubernetes in order to allow you to produce and consume messages. Um, it lets you view the metadata of the cluster, and it lets you perform administrative actions on your cluster. So the, um, the management plane are things like, how are my brokers? What are my topics? Uh, what's the state of my consumer groups? And I want to manage my access control lists. So if you wanted to create these as part of a ServiceNow uh, workflow or a GitHub workflow, then you just do the HTTP calls out to these. Um, on the data plane, of course, you produce and consume, um, you know, for, and, and including for continuous consumption in the same way that you would get for a client. You don't have the same rich set of features that you would get with a, uh, a framework client, uh, but it's, uh, it's still surprisingly faster than you might expect. Um, the, the Confluent Broker REST uh, is uh, somewhat similar, but it's a wider range of functions available. So this is a service that runs on 8090 on the broker. Um, and you can also do things like listing your partition re reassignments. Um, you, can, you can manage your consumer groups via this. So it, it, again, it's just making it easier and richer to build sort of DevOps integration directly back to your Kafka cluster, to your Kafka brokers. Um, and if you're running Confluent Cloud, which is the fully managed option for Kafka, where you don't have to think about zookeepers or brokers or VMs or anything, you simply create a cluster and produce and consume to your cluster. Um, then we, we launched a REST API for this in February um, to allow you to manage connectors. So you can set up like a, a CDC from Postgres into topics and then sync that out to Snowflake or Elastic or S3. Uh, any of these sorts of flows, you can have these as fully managed using connectors, and you can use you can manage the connectors via REST APIs again for automation of work, workflows. Manage your users, manage service accounts that you would create for microservices and uh, sort of non-human stuff, um, and environments, prod test dev. Uh, all of these sort of environment stuff is built into the fully managed product. And we're going to be adding uh, REST calls soon for topics, for managing ACLs, and for monitoring consumer lag. Uh, on Consumer Cloud. So we have published the REST API for Confluent Cloud as a Swagger. Um, so uh, the, the, the QR code is here, um, or you can jump onto the documentation for Confluent Cloud and, and uh, take a look through this and see if it's useful for you. Now, I didn't get into REST gateways today, stuff like MuleSoft and Apigee and uh, Anypoint, all that sort of stuff, uh, mostly because it's, it's, it's really quite a big topic. Uh, I recommend uh, uh, reading up um, my, my colleague Kai, uh, you know, blogs a fair bit on this point. Um, and this is a great, a good place to start. If you're running any of these frameworks um, and, and you have a need to integrate uh, sort of an event streaming application with the framework, then I think um, I would recommend diving in and having a, a look at this. Um, for those of you that are Apache Kafka users, I hope you're excited about the fact that Zookeeper is going away. 
uh, we're all we all we all love Zookeeper and all that, but it's you know kind of time to to release Kafka with one cluster instead of two clusters. Um, so that's on uh, Apache Kafka 2.8, which has early access. So you can fire up a system that has inbuilt uh, consensus with no separate Zookeeper cluster, which is a a fun thing to do if you're into distributed systems. Um, and that's my that's my talk. Just on time. I'm sorry I sped up a bit um, towards the end. I spent a little bit too much on the first slides. So as I say, I'm a principal engineer with Confluent in Singapore. You can contact me on LinkedIn or uh, at my email. I'm uh, happy to uh, answer any questions that you have, either now if we have time with your edge, um, or indeed afterwards. Thank you so much, Mark, once again, for an amazing session. Of course, uh, there would be a lot of following up questions that would come across to you. And thanks for sharing your contact details as well. So probably some of the audience who might not be able to interact with you right now is able to interact with you later. So uh, as part of uh, one of the uh, quick query from the audience uh, was there from the weekend on this about the resources to learn more about Apache Kafka. So probably you can share some of those URLs in the chat box that could be helpful, not just for the Vikana or other aspiring uh, techies who would like to dive deeper around the Apache Kafka and the REST APIs. But at the same time, I think uh, one of the uh, key questions that arises, if you can elaborate it a bit more on the, uh, the producer and consumer APIs, because I think uh, the great thing about a system like Kafka is that uh, producers and consumers are decoupled, uh, meaning amongst other things that we can produce data without needing a consumer in place first. And because of the decoupling, we can do so at scale. So an event happens, we send it to Kafka, simple as that. And as you explained it beautifully as part of this session as well. So all we need to do, uh, need to know a bit more in details about the Kafka cluster and the topic and a way of organize, uh, organizing data in Kafka, kind of like tables in an RDB, uh, RDB uh, to which we want to send the event. So if you have a couple of minutes to elaborate more on the producers and consumer APIs, I think would be really helpful for the audience. Sure, uh, uh, happy to. Um, on the developer side, developer.confluent.io is, is the landing page for all things uh, that, 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 that should be helpful for you. Um, so if you're particularly coming from the database world, it might be useful to have an analogy. So if Kafka is a database, then a topic is like a table. And it has, it has partitions in a similar way that a database table has partitions. Um, and then uh, you, know, the, doing the you do the equivalent of inserts into that table using the producer API. The producer API is, uh, is usually a, a Java application where you include the Kafka library and then you basically call produce and you ship the data over to Kafka. Kafka actually doesn't care what's in your message. So it could be text or binary or audio or video. It doesn't care. It's just taking a message and it's storing it and, 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 and waiting for the next message. Um, the process of using the, the produce API itself is in, there's no rest involved in this. So this is a, a high speed wire protocol framework. Um, you know, and, and the client is, is uh, the client is actually quite a thick client in order to achieve efficiency with uh, 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 streaming to and from the brokers. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and in situations where you can't use that, that we went into, that's really the, the opportunity to use the REST APIs. And the REST proxy is, is really just an application that, 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 that does have a Kafka client and it translates your HTTP calls into Kafka client produce and consume calls and sort of bridges between the two systems. Uh, I hope that was, I hope that's a, a good uh, summary. Absolutely, and thanks for answering that, uh, Mark, because I think it also uh, kind of explain in a nutshell about the producer and consumer APIs. And I do have a follow-up question uh, in which uh, it talks about the how easy or difficult is the integration of Apache Kafka with other systems, typically foreign organizations who have a large legacy system in place. So any thoughts regarding that from your end? Uh, it's a hell of a lot easier now than it was a few years ago, mostly because most of the third party vendors now have good Kafka interfaces. So if your, your ETL tool probably does have a good Kafka API, um, uh, so it's actually much easier to connect now using vendor products. If you're not using vendor products, then the next thing really is looking at your framework and writing an application. I think certainly streaming data in and out of uh, data stores and systems, Kafka Connect is the way to go. It's, a, it's an open source API 
It's part of the Kafka project. Anyone can download it, use it. Um, and it's a very easy way to just get started with reading data from a file and say I'm pushing it to a database or something like that. And it will stream in real time through Kafka. So I would say start with Kafka Connect. Awesome. Thanks again, Mark. So I think we are almost at the end of the session. So once again, Mark, really appreciate your time as well as your valuable insights of sharing it with the audience. And sure enough, it's it's a tough time here for the Indian community. And I'm sure with the kind of valuable insights and also uh, the opportunity to interact more with you will be really helpful for you. So hopefully, we will be able to see you next time as well. And uh, we will remain in touch with you and appreciate all your time and efforts in bringing this together. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dheeraj.